Amsterdam Thoughts and Dutch Courage by Dane Cobain Part 1 As the aeroplane rose, Matt's guts dropped and dragged him back down to the tarmac to that terrible moment when the rubber tyres skidded down the runway and then retracted into the aircraft's fuselage. Matt hated flying. He hated everything. He was also running, not from the police but from something else, something deep within him that he'd been running from for 15 years with no success. That little voice inside his head that liked to alternate between saying that he'd never amount to anything or that he could amount to something but only if he didn't die first. Matt hated dying unless it happened to other people in other countries. When the plane levelled out at 21,000 feet, Matt ordered a rum and coke. It cost a fortune and wasn't as good or as strong as his own concoctions but it did the job. Anything to take the edge off. Weed and beta blockers for the panic attacks and booze, booze, booze for when the depression hit hard and fast and without warning. At 21,000 feet, Matt was both anxious and depressed. It was a short flight, a 50 minute hop from Gatwick to Shipov, but it was long enough for him to sink three whiskies into Nora's nicotine stained fingernails to the quick until the taste of keratin and stale tobacco almost made up for the inability to smoke in public places. Matt asked one of the air hostesses for her number. She politely and professionally declined. Part 2. It wasn't just the flights that he hated. He also hated the associated ball ache. Checking in and scanning bags for explosives. The faff at passport control. The way that airports resembled hives with thousands of worker bees buzzing around the foyers or smoking cigarettes outside. Matt couldn't stand other people, particularly in bulk. After disembarking from the plane and shuffling through the crowds and out into the lobby, he jumped on a train to Central and strolled blindly down the dam rack looking for the dingy hotel he'd booked a room at. He didn't have a hat, so he put his passport on the bedside table instead. Matt was exhausted. After things back home had grown heated, he'd packed his bag in a hurry and hitchhiked to the airport. His ticket was already waiting on his mobile phone, and so he'd just had to rough it in the terminal, where a creaking automatic door had kept him awake all night. He passed out fully clothed on the bed without even hanging up the Do Not Disturb sign. Part 3 with no real plan in mind, other than the temporary desire to poison his body with anything that would make him forget, Matt left the hotel and strolled along the dam rack, past the sex museum and the infinite array of alleyways rammed with coffee shops and dodgy restaurants. He wandered through Dam Square and further south, until the buildings dissolved around him and he was strolling absent-mindedly through the Bloemen Mark, the delightful Dutch flower markets which were alive with a murmur of voices, the dings of cash registers and the pollen of the ubiquitous tulips. Matt bought a bouquet because a pretty young girl called Maria wouldn't leave him alone. Everything was grey and he didn't know whether it was his own bleak outlook or the hazy Dutch weather. A little colder than England in February but hardly noticeable. He could feel the demons taking over so he ducked into the nearest coffee shop, a gaudy affair with stone-faced security, and treated himself to the relative oblivion of half a gram of Afghan. Matt sat there and smoked in silence, thumbing through his battered copy of Crime and Punishment. After half an hour or so, he ordered a strawberry milkshake. That was when he saw her. She was sitting opposite him, wearing a pretty blue top and tight blue jeans which accentuated her curves, proudly proclaiming that her body was her body and that if Matt didn't like it, he could go fuck himself. Matt liked it a lot. He felt something, and it was unusual for him to feel. Her auburn hair covered half of her face, but he could instantly tell that she was beautiful. Not classically so, and not pretty like a teenager wearing too much makeup. She was stunning, a woman who took enough pride in her appearance to feel good, but not enough to let the opinions of other people destroy her. And she was passionate. She had a talent, something she was good at and that she loved doing, something that helped her to express herself and to stand apart from the faceless masses that surrounded Matt on the streets as he tried to avoid going about his business. She could have been a fucking pro. She was an artist, and she was sketching in a notebook with a joint of White Widow in one hand and a 2B pencil in her other. From where he sat, her sketchbook was upside down, but he could see enough to tell that she'd sketched her surroundings and that he was in shot, as it were. His curiosity got the better of him, so he walked over and introduced himself. Hey, he said, my name's Matt. Listen, this might sound crazy, but can I have a look at your sketchbook? Matt had never been much good with women. I couldn't help noticing your work, he continued. You're talented. I'd hang that up on my wall. The artist looked up and brushed hair from her face to reveal a pair of hypnotic hazel eyes. She smiled. Hi, Matt, she said, tearing the sheet from her notebook and handing it over to him. Nice to meet you. You seem like a decent guy. You can keep it. How much? he asked, and she laughed. Normally, eight euros, she said, but you can have it for free. 
She started to pack up her belongings into a little leather satchel. How about I take you to dinner tonight? Would that make up for it? I'm busy tonight, she said, hoisting the satchel onto her shoulder. Then how about tomorrow? She hesitated. 7.30, she said, at the chocolate bar. She was already on her feet and moving away from him. He shouted after her, but it was too late. She was already out the door. Then Matt realised that he didn't even know her name. Part 4 Back at the hotel that evening, Matt sat at an empty bar with his notebook, a pint of Jupiler and a shitty Dell laptop with three missing keys. The hotel room was inviting enough, but not when he was alone in it. He had that special mix of loneliness and anthropophobia which left him feeling miserable whether he had company or not. The hotel had a smoking room, but Matt was out of cigarettes and it wasn't helping his mood. The only thing keeping him sane was the drawing beside him. It had kept him company for over an hour while he'd searched the web in vain for Artist Amsterdam and Drawings Bush Doctor, the final word of the query being the name of the coffee shop where he'd met her. No dice, nada. His searches failed to uncover a single fucking thing, except for a bad review of the coffee shop which slated it for being too full of stoned Americans. Matt sighed, drained his Jupiler and ordered another one to take back to his room. All he'd learned was the location of the chocolate bar, which turned out to be an actual bar in the south of the city. But that was enough. Back in the room, he watched Geordie Shore on the only British channel that was available. He fell asleep shortly after finishing his drink, with the stranger's drawing beneath his pillow. Part 5 Matt hadn't felt this nervous since his first job interview, which he'd flunked after having a panic attack and passing out in reception. He'd showered, shaved and put on his best set of clothes, doused himself in Hugo Boss and polished his shoes until they shone, but he still looked scruffy because he always did. Matt had memorised the route to the bar and walked it earlier in the day. He arrived right on time, but she wasn't there. He waited. This is it, he thought. It's bloody typical. Nothing in Matt's life ever seemed to go right, except in his manic phases when he went gambling and stole cars. Then he saw her, almost half an hour later, although to Matt it had felt like a lifetime. She looked stunning in a scarlet dress, her hair curled and stroking her bare shoulders as it danced under the moonlight. Her legs were bare, defying the sharp wind that Matt could feel with a passing disinterest as it whipped against his face. Hey, he said, you made it. You look great. Thanks, she replied. You look pretty good yourself. Come on, let's go get a drink. She took Matt by the hand and led him inside to a seat just beside the window. She ordered a steak and Matt went for the cheese fondue. I brought some more of my drawings, she said. I thought you'd want to see them. Matt did want to see them and he said as much. He said he'd got a gift for her too, and then he gave her the flaccid tulips that he'd been carrying in his inside pocket since the flower market the day before. He didn't tell her that he'd slept with her other drawing beneath his pillow. The food was great, but the conversation was better, and Matt was transfixed by the way her lips framed words and phrases. He could have watched her talk all evening, and he sort of did. After their third drink, an hour after they'd finished eating, Matt suggested going somewhere else. She packed up her sketchbooks and readily agreed. Part 6 They took a tram towards Central and ended up in a karaoke bar. Matt had never done karaoke before, but he pulled out all the stops with a cover of a 50s rock and roll song that no one else had ever heard of. They still gave him a standing ovation when he left the mic, and his date gave him a hug that lasted so long that it gave him an erection. I still don't know your name, he said, when the embrace had died down and they were eyeing each other up uncertainly. Slow down, Matthew, she murmured, putting her finger to his lips. We'll have plenty of time for that later. Right now, we dance. Matt didn't dance, but he wasn't about to tell her that, so he let her lead him in a clumsy shuffle. He didn't recognise the song. Modern music didn't speak to Matt. Modern music didn't speak to anyone. But she didn't seem to care. In fact, she seemed to like it. After the dance, she sat him down and told him a bit more about herself. I'm 27, she said, but I look younger, right? Right. I get my youthful looks from my mother. I grew up in LA, but I came here one summer and fell in love with the place. It's the only city in the world that supports creativity rather than suppresses it. My work is better here. Your work is incredible, he said. It's worth more than the cost of dinner, for sure. It should be up in galleries. She laughed. If only. That's not how it works, is it? Matt paused and stared into the depths of his jupiler. I guess you're right, he said. Listen, lady, who the hell are you? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, she replied. So you can call me Rose. What does it matter to you? It's nothing, really, he mumbled. I just want to know the name of the woman I've fallen in love with. Part 7 Their hands were all over each other in the back of the taxi home, but Matt reasoned that Dutch cab drivers were probably used to it. 
Besides, it put him in a good mood and encouraged him to leave a bigger tip. Without a word, he led her past the doorman and through the labyrinthine corridors towards his hotel room. He hoped to God that the staff had cleaned his room, but of course they hadn't. Nothing ever went right for Matt. It was just one of the world's constants, like the laws of gravity and the speed of light in a vacuum. Luckily, she didn't seem to care about the unmade bed, the wet towels on the bathroom floor or the pair of boxer shorts that were hanging from the corner of the television set. All she cared about was him. Matt couldn't believe his luck. He did what he could to tidy while she went to freshen up in the bathroom, then flicked through the channels until he picked up some Dutch music videos. Not exactly James Brown, but it'd do. She came out just as he was fiddling with the lights to get the vibe right, wearing just her underwear and a self-conscious smile that hinted at something deeper, the animal inside her. She climbed under the covers. He pulled off his shirt and jeans, stuffed his socks in his shoes and joined her. They fucked and fell asleep in each other's arms, just as Geordie Shaw came on. Part 8 When Matt woke up, he was alone. The lights were off and it was still dark outside, but he could see by the light of the TV screen that he was lying in bed alone. He felt the anxiety rising almost immediately, but he fought back and switched the lights on, then searched the room for clues. It didn't take him long to find one. She'd left him a note. That's more than most women did. He picked it up and read through it. It had been written in a hurry using the hotel's headed stationery, and it was signed with a lipstick kiss and no name. Matt read the letter and tossed it in the trash, then climbed back into bed and fell asleep. Part 9 On the aeroplane home, Matt ordered a rum and coke again, but this time he was celebrating instead of drowning his sorrows. He didn't know why he was in a good mood, but he was. His retreat to Amsterdam hadn't lasted as long as he'd expected, but it had been enough to get the job done. Matt was a changed man, or at least he claimed to be in his embarrassingly sentimental status updates. Matt felt proud of himself. He'd left the depression and the anxiety behind when the aeroplane took off. There'd be no more of it, no more suicidal daydreams or long nights of insomnia, no more early mornings drinking alone and wishing he could disappear.